So today in my title is going to be Beyond Kidney Allo Transplantation, Advancements in Kidney Xenotransplantation and Artificial Kidney. For today's topic, I have no disclosures. Um, so for today, I'll be discussing several topics. One, we'll start off with what is our current state of options available for our ESRD patients um, in terms of what are the options as well as what's the prognosis for these um, modalities of treatments that we have to, um, to date. Um, most of the talk will be basically focusing on xenotransplantation, which is the current hot topic in kidney transplants and transplant in general. Um, and finally, we'll discuss where we are at this point with um, artificial kidneys and how close they are in terms of clinical use. So this is a graph that shows the uh, percent of survivals for patients who are on dialysis, also patients who are waiting on dialysis, waiting on kidney transplant list on, for dialysis, and also patients who receive or who have received um, transplants. So approximately about 10 patients actually die each day in the U.S. waiting for um, a life-saving organ in general. Um, there's over about 100,000 Americans currently on the transplant wait list and over about 90,000 patients waiting for a kidney. So you could tell that the majority of the patients on the wait list are for kidney transplants. And even more startling number is that there's at least half a million people in the U.S. who suffer from kidney failure who's actually requiring dialysis. And although patients who do get listed um, for a kidney transplant, um, about half of those patients, about 40% of the patients actually die within five years and will never actually um, be able to get a kidney transplant. And this usually happens because they either um, develop some sort of comorbidities um, that make them disqualified to getting a kidney transplant, or they die before actually um, being called in for a transplant. Um, and so this graph depicts that there's several survival curves, and you can see that dialysis overall has the most dismal patient survival curve. Um, and after that, you see that there's a slight improvement in patients who are on the wait list on dialysis. And this is because the patients on the wait list and also on dialysis are patients who are actually more healthier than the patients, the overall patients on dialysis. Um, and this you know, shows that there is definite um, survival benefits for patients getting kidney transplants. And so with this, what it shows is that despite, you know, close to 40,000 patients uh, who are receiving organ transplants per year and about 23,000 patients getting kidney transplants per year, there's unfortunately a significant uh, difference between actual supply and demand of organs. Um, so there's also, you could see that there hasn't really been much of an improvement in terms of the number of deceased organs that have been available each year. And because of the scarcity and a vast majority of dialysis patients also not qualifying for kidney transplant, this is something where, you know, where we've always been trying to improve in terms of kidney transplants. So what exactly is xenotransplantation? So according to the FDA definition, the definition of xenotransplantation is in any procedure that involves the transplantation, implantation, or infusion into a human's a recipient with either live cells or organs from a non-human animal source, or if human body fluids, cells, tissues, or organs that have had ex vivo contact with any sort of live non-human animal cells, tissues, or organs, that's considered xenotransplantation. Um, and to kind of um, depict this idea of chimerism between two different species, the Society of International Xenotransplantation Society, as well as its scientific journal, Xenotransplantation, selected this Mesopotamian mythical beast as their logo. Um, and this is basically a combination of a uh, bull's body with eagle's wings with humans. And so this basically symbolizes the role of incorporating different or um, an organ from a different species to a different species. In terms of advantages of transplantation, the driving factor basically for the actual advancement of genome transplantation is the lack of organs that we just discussed uh, for human organs in clinical transplantation today. Um, Cross-species transplantation would definitely offer a, like an unlimited supply of organs and cells for transplantation and would also allow organs to even be available electively um, and also possibly even available patients before they reach end-stage disease because currently, because of the shortage, um, patients who are in more severe advanced diseases are the ones who qualify for transplant. 
Um, it would also avoid the numerous adverse effects that can happen with um, brain death to the donor organs, um, which can lead to actually for some organs to never function, which is called primary graft non-function, or cause some damage that can delay the actual functioning of the organ. Um, also, since the pigs will be um, housed in an ideal control conditions and monitored at regular intervals for infectious, uh, infectious agents, so this is actually probably more of a controlled setting in terms of seeing if there's any infectious organisms that pop up instead of compared to patients who um, compared to patients who are receiving organs from deceased, uh, pa deceased patients, because in that setting, you could possibly actually uh, find out there's the virus that you acquire from the donor after the transplantation. Um, along with in long lines with having more organs available, that also means that borderline patients who would technically not have qualified for regular um, owl transplantation, so human to human transplantation, would also be able to get a kidney transplant because scarcity of organ uh, supply would not be an issue. Another also big major factor in other countries in the world would be uh, for cultures that have a little bit more difficulty in terms of accepting organs from deceased humans. And so that would definitely open up more organs for those populations and increase their um, patient survival. So going through the history of xenotransplantation, um, history of xenotransplantation starts around the 17th century. Um, and so between 17th and 20th century, there have been blood transfusions from various animal species into patients with various pathological conditions. Um, and then in terms of xenotransplant itself, initially started off with uh, skin grafts from animals um, and mostly from frogs, and these were performed in the 19th century. Um, following the pioneering of surgical work by Dr. Corral, who developed the technique of blood vessel anastomosis, then there were numerous attempts at non-human primate organ transplantation in patients were carried over throughout the 20th century, and this beginning with kidneys. Somewhere in 1960s, Dr. Remstub transplanted chimpanzee kidneys to 13 patients. Um, this is when there were no um, human organs available for transplantations, and there were also no chronic dialysis modalities available during that time. And so out of for some one of the patients out of these 13 patients actually even returned to work and was um, functioning for nine months, but suddenly died. Um, which was most likely believed to be due to electrolyte disturbances. And this is actually something that is currently being seen also in the non-humate primate um, experiments that are currently done today. Um, following the kidney transplant, the first heart transplant was performed by Dr. Hardy in 1964 using a chimpanzee heart. Um, the patient unfortunately died within two hours. And then following that was when there was the first liver xenotransplantation by, by Dr. Starzl. So in terms of what are the sources of organs, there's pig organs, baboon organs. Um, there's been significant process uh, progress in terms of the development of genetic modification of these large animals. And science has really allowed us to kind of identify the potential targets that are very important to kind of create these tissues that are resistant to human immune responses. And many of these immunological barriers have been already identified, but in terms of trying to translate that to actual clinical work is where the work is being done at many centers throughout the United States and also in the entire world. Um, so in terms of pigs versus baboons, pigs have been the species of choice in xenotransplantation um, and for several reasons. Um, they are easier to raise and they also mature and grow in a faster rate. So it's been shown to be more of an ideal source of potential organs for xenotransplantation. The pathobiological response that we see in pig organs, you know, transplant involves numerous immune pathways. Um, and this is also seen um, also in regular transplantation today. So this includes like antibody um, pathways, complement activation, coagulation pathways, inflammatory responses, and several cellular responses as well. Um, and if the pig kidneys were not genetically modified, let's say, and we decided we're just going to transplant this pig kidney into um, to a non-human primate or even to humans, what would happen? Well, it will actually lead to immediate hyperacute rejection and destruction of the kidney. Um, and this happens because, for example, for humans, uh, what happens is during the first few months of your life, um, because you're exposed to bacteria and viruses that colonize in your intestinal tract, your body basically forms an antibodies in response to those bacteria and viruses. And so then when you're introduced, this pig organ, because those antigens are very similar to what is found on the pig vascular endothelium, 
So then the kidney or your immune system tries to counteract against this xenotransplanted organ. So in terms of gen genetic modification, which is basically the key part of xenotransplantation, there's been several targets that are currently being studied, and they all kind of are targeted in, in antigens that are expressed in vascular endothelium. Um, the most important one is, is that since in humans, um, endothelium usually, or the antigens that are expressed are the AB blood groups. But for a pig's vascular endothelium, that's actually something different. It's like lactose um, oligosaccharide. And so with the presence of galactose in pigs and its absence in humans, that basically leads to humans generating an anti-gal antibody. And when the organs are transplanted to humans, the human immune system will directly um, basically direct these antibodies that they have to bind to these cells on the graft to activate complement cascade and leading to hyperacute rejection. Um, and so to avoid this, um, the genetic modifications, gene engineering, we've been trying to overcome this by actually making gene knockout pigs that basically don't express the galactose so that you don't have a human response when you actually transplant these organs. Um, these organs. And another way to actually prevent human antibodies to uh, form against pig antigens is also to try to increase the resistance of these pig organs to human complement mediated injury. Um, and this has been achieved by inserting some, um, some one or more human complement regulatory proteins that we have, such as CD55 or CD46 into the pig gene. Um, and so with these modifications, it prevents hyperacute rejections, and it has been already been proved in non-human primate uh, models. Um, so to kind of summarize the targets in terms of what we look for in xenotransplantation, the two major pathways is one, we try to delete the pig xenoantigens that our human immune system tries to respond against, and two is to actually inserting protective human transgenes to counter the human immune response. Um, and then another thing that's also been done um, is that they also deleted gene encoding for the growth hormone um, because they've noted that in these non-human primate studies, they've seen this rapid growth of pig organs after transplantation. And this is probably just a physical physiological growth that we see in pigs early on. So what is our current progress in terms of the actual graft survival? Um, so this graph here shows the kidney graft survival over the years with all the experiments that have been done so far. And you could see that now, nowadays it has improved, improved quite a bit to a point where um, the non-human primate survival is over one year. And this is in part because of all the gene engineering that we have where we actually know what targets to modify in terms of these knockout um, pig genes that or pig, um, pigs that we actually create. So what is the ideal combination of immunosuppression for xenotransplantation? Would like the same medications that we currently use for kidney transplantation be ideal? Um, or do we have to think out of, outside the box because maybe the human response to a non-human organ might be different from a human response to a human organ? Um, and so the current standard for kidney transplantation right now is what we call CNI-based regimen or calcineurin-based regimen. And so that consists of tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and plus minus prednisone or corticosteroids. Um, and this has been pretty effective, or it's the gold standards that has reduced the rate of acute rejection uh, to less than 20% um, over the years. Um, so the there's been several non-human primate experiments that have shown that the, uh, the regimens that still have the CNI-based um, model actually have a low, um, have a much worse survival rate than actually using other medications that target a different pathway, which will be called co-stimulation blockade. There are several um, co-stimulation pathways in the immune system, but the one that has been, um, seems to be most effective is um, the CD40, CD40 ligand pathway. And so this graph shows that uh, the baboon survival is better in patients who are on this co-stimulation blockade um, regimen compared to those in the CNI-based regimen. Um, and then also the rejection free rate is also improved in patients who are on this co-stimulation blockade versus those on the standard regimen. Um, and this is reassuring because that shows that 
we can use something that we have in our toolbox because we do have several co-stimulation blockade either in actual clinical use or in clinical trials currently. So it means that we could, you know, we could probably use what we have already today for a regular transplantation to optimize the, um, the survival, graft survival, as well as patient survival in xenotransplantation in the future. Another thing that has been introduced into xenotransplantation is tolerance. Um, and this is actually going to be very interesting because with tolerance, it has obviously been applied to regular human transplant right now. Um, but with xenotransplantation, it might actually be easier because you could also do some gene modifications so that tolerance would be actually more um, successively achieved. Um, and so I think this might actually put tolerance in a... Um, will uh, will be applied more more so in xenotransplantation than what it has been today. So why tolerance is a big deal in transplantation is is that it reduces the need for immunosuppression in general, and that's definitely something that is a burden for transplant patients after surgery. And so with this figure, it shows that there's two ways they could actually create tolerance. Um, and so, for the first one, um, so what it shows is that you take the bone marrow from the donor pig and you inject it into a T-cell depleted baboon. Um, and then the donor bone marrow derived dendritic cells migrate to the host thymus. So then you actually ne negatively select developing donor reactive host T-cells resulting in tolerance to donor cells. In the second scenario, what it does is that they actually transplant the thymus um, sometimes into the cal capsule of the kidney. Um, and by doing this, so the donor big pig thymus is, um, is going to basically be um, transplanted to a T-cell depleted thym uh, thymectomized baboon. And what happens is that the T-cells develop from the host T-cells precursors go to the donor thymus, which and then tolerance to the donor will be induced by negative selection through the generation of regulatory T-cells. And so that brings us to what's been the hype of uh, of uh, transplantation at this time, which is xenotransplantation. Um, xenotransplantation has been hitting the headlines for the past year with several breakthrough xenotransplants, both for both kidney organs as well as hearts from pigs to humans. Um, and centers across the country, including um, NYU, University of Alabama, and uh, University of Maryland have been part of this race in trying to achieve this goal of bringing xenotransplantation into reality and transplant. So this article was recently published in New, in New England Medical Journal to summarize the experiences of New York um, in terms of their uh, kidney transplants. They were performed in September and November 2021. Um, so these two kidney xenotransplants ended up not having any acute rejection and also no antibody rejection. So that means that it was successful in terms of having the human accept these um, pig organs. Um, many are, so the interesting about thing about this is that we know that a lot of people understand that organ donation means that you donate your organs at the time of death for, for the benefit of others in terms of donating it actually for transplantation. Um, another way that organ donation can actually be used, and it's actually to contribute to research for scientific advancements, is actually a whole body donor or, or a donation. And so this is what happened here in where um, there was an NYU deceased donor who was who chose to be a donor, um, but his organs unfortunately were not suited for donation. So his family approved for his entire body to be actually used for xenotransplant research. And so after that, the surgeons at NYU attached the pig's kidney to a brain dead patient and monitored the kidney function after transplant and seeing how the body responds to this pig organ. Um, the kidney was attached to the blood vessels in the patient's um, upper leg outside of the abdomen. So. It's the same blood vessels that we connect in transplantation today. Um, however, it was outside of the abdomen, which is obviously different from what it is today. Um, and then they also had the pig's thymus transplanted under the ki uh, kidney capsule. So this is what we were talking about earlier about tolerance. Um, and so what happened with these kidneys were that they actually started to make urine almost immediately, which is great. Um, there were no signs of rejection during this 54 hour study period that they had. Um, so these two graphs basically show that there's improvements in EGFR, which is a marker of how um, kidney is functioning over time, and also how much urine is actually made from this thymal kidney for these two recipients. So another center, UAB, so University of Alabama, published their results on their xenotransplant experience. Um, for their center, they transplanted two pig kidneys, um, and so how they did it was that they removed the kidneys, both kidneys actually, from the person who um, who was brain dead, 
and then they um, transplanted the pig kidneys to that human. Um, and then for this case also, they didn't see any sort of rejection. Um, they monitored the, um, the patient for 74 hours and the kidneys seemed to have been viable throughout this entire time. Um, the kidneys didn't produ did produce a variable amount of urine throughout the 74 hour time period. Um, but unlike the other one, it seems like the renal clearance was not very good in recovering, um, but it definitely showed, was another step in terms of advancements for xenotransplant. And then finally, we, we come to the cardiac xenotransplant that was performed in the University of Maryland. Um, and this was performed earlier this year in January, and this was definitely a huge milestone in xenotransplantation world. Um, so what happened was is that University of Maryland was able to receive special permission from the FDA to perform this first emergency transplant of a genetically modified um, pig heart into a human who is alive. So this is not a deceased donor or deceased recipient um, and who was, who was actually going to die otherwise because of his uh, severity of heart disease. Um, it was done successfully, but the patient did pass after two months after the xenotransplantation. Um, they're still kind of investigating in terms of what actually led to the death of the patient. Um, the things that they have considered is maybe it's possibly because of medications they gave them after transplantation to prevent rejection, which we, which we call IVIG. Um, or it could possibly be due to a latent pig, pig virus that they found in the heart muscle after autopsy, but it's not really sure if that's really a pathologic virus or was it, or does it actually affect um, the heart muscle function. So then that means that there will probably be going to be clinical trials of pig kidney transplantations or xenotransplantations in general pretty soon. Um, and I think out of all the organs, most likely kidney transplants would be the first one because with, uh, with um, kidney xenotransplantation, um, that means that there's also other modalities that you could use. So dialysis, if, for example, if the pig kidney doesn't actually work immediately, you could still support the patient to stay alive through dialysis. Or if unfortunately they develop some sort of severe acute rejection and you have to remove the, uh, the xeno, um, xenograft, then you could still have the patient obviously survive on dialysis. So that really makes kidney transplant the best organ to start off with for these clinical trials. Um, and I think in terms of who we should select for these um, clinical trials, um, it's probably gonna be best for patients who what we discussed earlier in terms of those patients who will never be able to get a kidney transplant, either because they have multiple comorbidities or because they'll probably die on the wait list before getting a transplant. Um, and then certain blood types do have a slightly longer um, wait times. And so those uh, patients might also benefit from being in these clinical trials as well, instead of waiting on the wait list and potentially not even getting a kidney transplant. Um, other things to consider is that we shouldn't um, accept patients for clinical trials for xenotransplant who actually have anti-HLA antibodies um, because there might be some cross-reactivity uh, with the pig, pig antigens, meaning that it could actually lead to higher risk of rejection and it would kind of confound the variables in terms of what led to the rejection of that organ. There's other patients that might also benefit with these clinical trials, and these include patients, um, dialysis patients who actually are losing vascular access, which does happen. Um, and so I, this might be a modality because they're, you know, um, basically running out of time in terms of access and transplantation might not be something that might happen in the near future. Um, and then finally, um, I don't think it's something that we should be offering to patients who are not on uh, dialysis yet, because at this point, the point of these clinical trials is to really compare what does xenotransplant do compared to what dialysis can do. And if it obviously achieves something better, then that's, you know, that's definitely a win, win situation. So in terms of potential concerns with the use of non-human organs, um, so although we've discussed all these potential benefits and they are very considerable, the use of xenotransplantation definitely raises concerns for potential infections of transplant recipients for infectious bugs that are recognized or not even really recognized yet um, with the current science and the possible transmission to close, close contacts of patients and even maybe even to the general human population. So that's definitely something to consider. Um, there's also potential public health concerns about cross um, cross species of viruses, um, but and you know there's always going to be new infectious agents that we don't know yet. And in terms of when we'll be able to identify those with the testing techniques, is also very unclear. However, to the best that they can, 
these pinks are housed under strict control settings. And so for all of the pathogens that are known, it's actually very well controlled that there should really be a very minimal risk in terms of transmission. There's also going to be definitely ethical or religious questions in terms of using animals in general, um, in terms of animal welfare, and as also as well as using animals in large quantities to um, basically save human life. And although there's been surveys out there to see how the general public kind of sees xenotransplantation and the possibility of that being a major player in transplantation, um, there actually hasn't been as much opposition as one have, may have anticipated before. So then that brings us to what is the current status of artificial kidney? And I think that's a very important topic um, because although there's been significant investments in xenotransplantation, we still have to you know, kind of increase the organ pool and other modalities. And these include other um, actually in increasing our current human organ donor pools, which have already been probably discussed in prior lectures in this mini medical series. And also we have to consider how we can also make advancements in stem cell technology and artificial kidneys to also create more options for our kidney patients. And so before we kind of dive in into what artificial kidneys are and also what is available currently, um, I wanted to kind of briefly go into what exactly dialysis does. And so the particles that dialysis is designed to remove, which are called uremic toxins, accumulate in patients who have failed kidneys because the kidneys are not there to be able to filter these toxins anymore. Um, and molecules are divided by molecular weight. So there's low molecular weight mo uh, molecules, middle mole molecular models, and also large solutes. In terms of low molecular weight molecules, this includes urea. Um, and actually clearance of urea is a very important measure that we use in terms of dialysis. Um, because it's a measure that we use to see how well do are the patients actually being dialyzed, and it has been correlated with patients' outcomes. In terms of the significance for middle molecular weight toxins, that has been a little bit less clear, but in terms of larger and protein-bound toxins, it has been shown to contribute to cardiovascular disease and end-stage renal disease patients. Um, so with these toxins, what happens is the toxin solutes are removed by hemodialysis through three mechanisms. Um, one is diffusion, which is basically going down the gradient, and this is better for smaller molecules. Um, the second modality is convection or solvent drag, which is basically using fictional force between water and solute to result in removal of these toxins. Um, and this is more so effective in larger solutes. And then finally, it's the absorption solutes with the dialysis membrane. So the goals to achieve in artificial kidneys, the real major goal is really for these portable artificial kidneys to really focus on really improving the quality of the life of ESRD patients. Because as many of us heard and have experienced maybe in close family members or friends, um, in-center dialysis really consumes a lot of time and also resources for the patients. Um, and you've also probably heard with intermittent dialysis, since it's not done on a regular basis, patients feel very exhausted after, you know, after their treatment are feeling debilitated and really not being able to perform daily tasks. And definitely this takes a toll on their caregivers as well. Um, and even with other modalities like peritoneal dialysis or even home hemodialysis, there are also issues as well because with peritoneal dialysis, Yes, this does definitely gives, gives patients more freedom, um, but the amount of equipment that's needed is really not ideal and it's not really available for all patients. So that definitely kind of limits the patients who are able to be on peritoneal dialysis. Um, with hemodialysis, it does require an expensive water purification system, and that's probably not something that everybody has access to. Um, so that's also a limitation. And so the hope for artificial kidneys is to really break down these barriers so that we are able to provide more patients with more self-care treatment options. So the three types of artificial kidneys that are currently in development are the automated wearable artificial kidney, um, the wearable artificial kidneys, and then implantable artificial kidneys. So these are supposed to be either worn or implanted throughout the day, so it's 24-7. Um, and so for the two, the first two of them, the automated wearable artificial kidney and the wearable artificial kidney, what it's trying to do is for, uh, for it to kind of model what peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis does. So it's kind of a portable dialysis. Um, and so the wearable artificial kidney is the version of the hemodialysis that is portable. 
and the artificial uh, and the automated wearable artificial kidney is the peritoneal dialysis version of artificial kidneys. Um, and then implantable kidneys is more of a hybrid um, that also involves in terms of um, uh, also stem cell research as well. So the first one I want to discuss was the wearable artificial kidney, which is the small portable version of hemodialysis is what you could kind of think of it as. And so it is basically, uh, it's a battery operated device and you could actually wear it like a belt or sometimes even as a vest. And it's actually not very heavy. I know it looks a little bit clunky, but it's about two pounds or so. Um, and what it does is that the dialysate is actually regenerated by the cartilages in the system. And so as you know, with dialysis, it requires a huge machine and also requires a lot of volume in terms of the fluid that it uses. But because they have this regeneration process going on with the different cartilages, um, and so that allows um, this wearable artificial kidney to only use a little bit amount of fluids. Um, and the good thing about this compared also to, let's say, like home hemosystems is, is that it doesn't require the same amount of electricity and water intensity that those that home hemosystems require. The other thing that happens is that the, what we do is that we basically connect this device to the hemodialysis catheter. And then there's also a pump that actually delivers heparin, which is a blood thinner to make sure that it doesn't clot off. Um, and it's currently being studied in terms of trying to aim for a 24 hour modality. Um, and since there's probably a risk for needle dislodgements from dialysis ac access, vascular access, such as fistulas and grafts. So it's currently being designed to be connected to a tunnel line because dislodgement wouldn't be much of an issue. Um, but it's still unclear in terms of what does it mean to be on dialysis 24 seven, because that's definitely not something that we do to, you know, today. Um, and so, because that means that with someone who has a um, tunnel catheter 24 seven actually connected to the machine, does that increase the risk of infection? And definitely that leads to increased mortality in patients. And so that's something that definitely needs to be addressed. In terms of the automated wearable kidney, so this is the peritoneal dialysis version of artificial kidneys. Um, it also uses the regeneration dialysate system to kind of reduce the fluid requirements. So it composed, it's composed of basically a tubing set, storage modules, and this controller all packaged into this little, um, little form that looks kind of like a small purse. And so surprisingly, so compared to like, let's say traditional peritoneal dialysis where each volume that the patient actually inserts to their abdomen is typically something somewhere that ranges between about a liter to 1.5 liters. The tidal volume for these wearable um, PD artificial kidneys is actually only 500 cc's. Um, and so that's definitely a um, quite advancements from all these clunky equipments that are necessary for peritoneal dialysis. Unfortunately, uh, what, have, what is required is that the cartilages do need to be replaced every seven hours, meaning that you'll probably need at least three to four cartilages that are changed each time. Um, so with each cartilage, usually um, each cycle is about seven and a half minutes, meaning that you have actually eight exchanges per hour. Um, and kind of similar to what the concerns are with the 24-hour hemo artificial kidney is with this 24-hour peritoneal dialysis, what are the consequences of actually being on peritoneal dialysis for 24 hours? Because there's certainly complications of peritoneal dialysis, this conventional dialysis that we do today, including peritonitis, um, hyperglycemia, so like high glucose levels, membrane failures, and encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. And so are those, gonna, are those things gonna be at a much higher risk if you do um, peritoneal dialysis um, all day long? And so lastly, um, so we, I want to discuss about implantable artificial kidneys. Um, so implantable artificial kidney was influenced by innovations done in Michigan um, by, doc, by Dr. Humes. And this is what is being researched in our kidney project at UCSF, which is done alongside um, Vanderbilt University. Um, so with this implantable artificial kidney, it is basically a biohybrid that, com that combines artificial filters and also living cells designed to address the problem of you know, the requirement of large dialysis um, volumes for dialysis in general. Um, and it also reduces the, necess the necessity to find some electro electrical supply. Um, and so with this modality, what it uses is that it uses the silicon nanotechnology um, and tissue engineering that requires basically a surgical implantation 
of cells. And so it kind of tries to mim mimic the structures of um, the kidneys that we have. Um, and so what it does is that they take these renal tubular epithelial cells or kidney cells um, and try to put it in these um, biocartilages. And it connects directly to the vasculature of the human. So that actually eliminates the complete need of any sort of electrical pumps. Um, and so what it does is basically using, you know, taking advantage of human physiology, they use human blood pressure to pump blood through this filter system. So you don't need any sort of um, energy source. Um, the concentrated waste is extruded through as an artificial urine, and it actually goes through the bladder. Um, so it pretty much essentially kind of looks at, look like what we do today with regular transplantation in terms of where it's implanted, how it's connected to the bladder. So in terms of the current obstacles and the development or the advancements of artificial kidneys, definitely artificial kidneys have shown significant improvements, but it has been pretty, uh, it has been a, a little bit sluggish in terms of trying to reach the goal of actually making it into reality. Um, and, you know, these implements are because there's, I think there's still things that we need to figure out in terms of how do we reduce the number of cartilages that we need to change every day. Um, and also in terms of medications that we use in terms of uh, preventing clotting of the dialysis circuit, is it really safe to have someone being on heparin drips or heparin medications 24 seven? That's also something that needs to be addressed. Um, volume and optimizing that is certainly something that can always be um, improved. Um, and also things to also consider is devices really need to last for a long time because you don't want people to have repeated um, procedures to replace these um, devices. Um, and finally, just like we mentioned, both for hemodialysis and for peritoneal dialysis, what are the long-term effects of being on dialysis for 24 hours, uh, which is quite drastically different from what we do today. So in summary, um, xenotransplantation has made great strides and has had very promising outcomes in overcoming barriers that has allowed xenotransplantation to progress to from bench research to clinical trials. Um, but there's still a lot of unknowns that still need to be addressed, and um, especially in terms of what will be the human response to um, xenografts in the long run, too. What are, is it going to be more drastically severe in terms of uh, um, the immune response to these xenotransplants that we haven't still figured out with, um, with experimental models, we're not really sure yet at this point. Um, and then, but, you know, currently it's very promising that there are several groups that are already applying to receive approval for these clinical trials, and so hopefully we'll see these um, in the near future. Um, and in terms of artificial kidneys, we've discussed that it's been making progress, but definitely there are points that we still need to address. So I want to end today with a quote from Winston Churchill that kind of summarizes our road to making xenotransplantation and artificial kidneys a reality and, and really holds true for any sort of investment in science. Um, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is courage to continue that counts. And thank you for your attention.